Hello, today we're continuing with our GCSE Physics Revision series looking at sound and ultrasound. Sound waves are longitudinal waves as opposed to light which is a transverse wave. So we're used to a transverse wave that looks like this, that's light, but sound is different. Sound is made up of compressions of the air. Indeed, sound has to have a medium through which to travel. It cannot travel through a vacuum. And what effectively it does is it compresses the air in some places, but it has the air rarefied elsewhere, and then you have another compression, and then it's rarefied, and then another compression. And essentially what's happening is that these compressions are moving backwards and forwards all the time, so that different bits of the air are being compressed. This section here is called a compression. This section here is called a rarefaction. The wavelength of a sound wave is simply the distance between two consecutive compressions. And the frequency of the sound wave will be the number of times per second that the compression goes to a rarefaction and back to a compression again. And with sound waves, the frequency determines the pitch. The higher the pitch, the higher the note. The amplitude determines how loud the sound is. The higher the amplitude, the louder the sound. And as I've said, sound cannot travel through a vacuum because it must travel through a medium because it is the medium, it is the molecules of the air or indeed of water or indeed of a solid like glass that are vibrating and it is those vibrations which carry the longitudinal wave which becomes sound and you hear it when it hits your inner ear and causes the diaphragm in your ear to vibrate and that sends signals to your brain which interprets that as noise. Just like light, sound waves can reflect and refract. So if you send a sound wave from air into, let's say, water, here is the sound wave coming in. Some of it will be reflected and some of it will be refracted. The fact that sound is reflected is what gives rise to an echo. If you're standing here and you make a sound, and here's a brick wall, you make a sound, the sound travels to the brick wall, it reflects and you hear it at a slightly later time. Because in air, uh, the speed of sound is about 340 meters per second. So it's quite fast, but nothing like the speed of light. And so the uh, sound travels to the wall and a fraction of a second later, you hear the reflected sound. And we call that an echo. As I said, the speed of sound is 340 meters per second, which is approximately one mile in every five seconds. So I was always taught if I was out in a thunderstorm, when you see the lightning flash, which of course is instantaneous because that's light, you count the number of seconds between the flash of lightning and the clap of thunder. And if it is less than five seconds, that means that that thunder is less than a mile away from you. So you ought to make haste and get home or get in, into some safe shelter as soon as possible. Whereas if you counted more than five seconds, then the thunder is at least a mile away from you and that gives you a bit of time to get home safely. But the speed of sound is dependent on what it's going through. Going through air, it travels at 340 meters per second. But if it's going through a liquid or a solid, it travels much faster, perhaps of the order of 1500 meters per second. As I said, the frequency of the sound determines the pitch. And middle C on a piano, is 256 hertz. Frequency, remember, is measured in hertz. And the human ear is capable of hearing from about 20 hertz, which is a very low note, up to about 20 kilohertz, which is a very high note, much higher than that, actually. But your hearing capacity changes as you grow older. Consequently, as you grow older, the top notes, or really the high frequencies, will not be, um, you won't be able to hear them. 
So now we move to ultrasound, and ultrasound is any sound that is above 20 kilohertz. That is sound which we will not be able to hear because it's outside our hearing range. And that can be anything from 20 kilohertz up to the gigahertz region. And the way ultrasound is used is on the basis that uh, normally you would shoot ultrasound vertically uh, onto a surface, but the idea is when you come to a surface between two media, I use the example of air and water, but frankly any change in the media, some of that sound will be reflected and some of it will be transmitted. And it's that principle that is the basis of all use of ultrasound. So suppose you've got a patient, this is the surface of their skin, this is the skin and muscle thickness, and then you've got some bone here. What you would typically do is to put the ultrasound device on the surface of the skin, and you'll notice if you've been in hospital and seen this, that they rub a kind of a gel onto the, um, screen, onto the skin. The reason for this is that sound travels much slower in air, so you do not want any air between the uh, ultrasound device and the skin itself. You want something that is liquidy where the, where the sound will travel at the kind of speed it's going to travel through the solids here. So you don't mess up your readings. So gel is used so there's no air caught between the ultrasound device and the skin. And then you send a pulse of ultrasound down. Now as soon as it gets to this surface between the skin and the bone, some of it will be reflected and some of it will be transmitted. And consequently, you have not only this ultra, uh, ultrasound device is, is emitting ultrasound, but it also has the capacity to detect it. And of course, this is really nothing more than an echo. And the echo will be a slight delay. So there will be a difference in time from the time the ultrasound pulse left to the time it hit the surface and was reflected back to the ultrasound device. That time, that very short time, we're going to call delta t. Now we know the speed of sound, we'll call that v, and we know that velocity is distance divided by time. Consequently, distance is velocity times time. We know the velocity, that's the velocity of, sa of sound in skin, and we know the time, we measure it, it's delta t. And so that enables us to measure the thickness of the skin. But notice this, that the time you measure is the time for the sound to travel twice through the skin. First of all, the downwards journey and then the upwards journey. So you're actually measuring the time taken to travel twice the thickness of the skin. So actually the real thickness of the skin is only half of V times T. But there might be several layers. So you might have the surface of the skin you might then have a layer of muscle and then a layer of bone. So once again, you put your ultrasound device on the surface of the skin, making sure that there's no air. So you put gel on and you send in your pulse of sound, which hits the first uh, surface and reflects. But it also transmits until it hits the second surface and then that too will reflect. And then when it hits the third surface, that too will reflect. And so you will get the time delta T1 for this first wave to reflect, the time delta T2 for this second wave to reflect, and the time delta T3 for this third wave to reflect back. So if you want to know what, for example, is the thickness of the middle layer, then you simply take the difference in time between the, the time for the second pulse to arrive and the first pulse to arrive. So the delta T2 minus delta T1 is the time it took for the sound just to travel twice, as it were, there and back in this particular layer. So you can compute the thickness of this middle layer simply by knowing I should say the difference in time between the time it took to go down to here and back 
and the time it took to go down to here and back. The difference is the time it took to go from there and back. So let's say that that difference, let's say that that equals 10 microseconds. Then what is the thickness of this middle layer here? Well, we said velocity is distance over time, which means that the distance is velocity times time. The velocity is 1500 meters per second, and the time is 10 times 10 to the minus six seconds. So that comes out to be 0.015 meters. But remember, that is the distance to go there and back. So that's effectively twice the thickness that you want to measure. So the actual thickness of the muscle that you're measuring here is actually only half that. So you have to multiply by a half and that comes to 0.0075 meters, which is about 7.5 millimeters. But clearly, if there is something in here that shouldn't be there, then there will be an additional reflection of the sound that will give you the impression that there's something there that shouldn't be. The actual display of ultrasound is usually on what's called an oscilloscope, sometimes called a cathode ray oscilloscope, which has a horizontal and vertical scale. The horizontal scale in this case is usually measured in time, so that would be in microseconds, and the vertical scale is a kind of a voltage equivalent to the pulse that comes back from the ultrasound. So if you've got a pulse here and another pulse here, that would tell you how many microseconds separated the pulses. So this is the pulse that you emit, this is the pulse that you detect, and it's one, two, three, four, five, six microseconds later. How might you use ultrasound? Well, one device uh, can be used to break down kidney stones. Kidney stones are hard masses that block the urinary tract. They are often very painful. If you use high energy ultrasound, those beams are vibrating and they vibrate within the kidney stone and they can cause it to break up and break up into smaller particles like sand, which you can actually pass out in urine. Um, and that's obviously much safer. You don't need an operation. The ultrasound has no radiation associated with it, so it's completely safe as far as we know. Ultrasound is also used for prenatal scans. The ultrasound waves are partially reflected every time they reach a boundary. So a computer can build up all of these reflected uh, bits of information to build an image of the baby in the womb. And that is the computer produced image that you often see. Once again, you'll find that whenever women have these scans, they always put a gel between the skin and the ultrasound device. Why would you use ultrasound when you could use x-rays? The problem with ultrasound is that the images you get are very fuzzy. If you've ever seen the image of a baby um, developing in a womb, it's not particularly clear compared to the usually razor sharp images you get from x-rays. Well, the point is that, of course, ultrasound is safe. It's non-ionizing. You may get uh, a fuzzy picture but far rather get a fuzzy picture of a baby than that you risk doing uh, serious damage with x-rays. X-rays, on the other hand, do ionize, they do pose a danger, but they give a clearer picture. In the case of a CT scan, you are exposed to a lot of radiation, but you get a much better picture of what's going on. So you have to balance the risks and the benefits. Sometimes you have to take a CT scan because although that exposes the patient to quite a lot of danger, the benefit is that you might identify something that's wrong and be able to do something about it. There's another way that ultrasound can be used in what's called sonar. Here is a ship sailing on the sea. Here is the bottom of the ocean. And we want to know how deep, in other words, how much water have you got so that you make sure you're at a safe distance or safe depth. Same principle applies. You have an ultrasound device which sends an ultrasound pulse. When it hits the bottom of the seabed, it reflects and you time how long it took for the signal to get from the pulse until it was received again as an echo. And once again, you know that velocity is distance over time. 
and therefore distance is velocity times time. But remember that the time you measure, that's this time here, is the time it took to travel twice the depth of the sea because it went down to the bottom and back up again in the time delta t. So this distance you're measuring is twice the depth of the ocean. So you must remember to divide vt by 2 to get the true depth of the ocean. The speed of sound in seawater is approximately 1560 meters per second. So if, for example, delta t was one second, so it took one second for the, uh, the ultrasound pulse to go down to the bottom of the sea and back up again, then you know that the distance that has been travelled is the velocity, which is 1560 times the time, which is one second. So d is equal to 1560 times 1, which is 1560 metres. But that is not the depth of the sea, the depth, of course, because that's the distance it travelled there and back. The depth of the sea is half of that, and half of that will be 780 metres.